There's Just Something About Kansas City is brought to you in part by the generosity of our friends at the Cockrell Family Foundation and the Sherman Family Foundation. Thank you. Welcome once again to another edition of There's Just Something About Kansas City. And today I've been brought back into my childhood, folks. And I know if you've lived in Kansas City for any period of time, you know about the Toys and Miniatures Museum, the National Toys and Miniatures Museum here in Kansas City. Probably driven past a hundred times, but how many times have you been here? That's what I'm gonna ask you now. And right next to me is the executive director of the, uh, the National Museum for Toys and Miniatures is Petra Kralichkova. And uh, she joins us, and I, I appreciate you taking your time. This place is absolutely phenomenal. It is really amazing. Thank you for having me. It's such a great show. I watched a couple of them, and you just championed the culture scene so well. So yeah, well, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. We, we, we appreciate what you're doing here. <laughs> you know, I, I know you got here back in 2017. Mm -hmm. You're originally from Czechoslovakia, yes, I am. and uh, you have had a a really uh, an interesting journey to mm -hmm. get here, to be I sitting did. here with us today. I know you've been here for about seven years now, but um, uh, it, it is, um, I went back through the rooms and all of a sudden I'm going, <laughs> I got that when I got my tonsils out. I got those when I, when I was sick from school for a couple of days and all this sort of thing. So for me, it's like, and I think for everybody, because mm -hmm. it in, takes yeah. you all through the generations of toys. Yes. It's just incredible. Yeah. Well, there really is something about Kansas City, and there really is something about the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures. And like you highlighted, when I when I walk through the hallways and listen to visitors, it's just such a joy. It's what they say, oh my God, I had that toy. <laughs> or I, I walked by and I was like, oh my God, remember you used to cut the hair of the Barbie and then you were drawing on the face? Or, oh my God, remember grandma still has this yeah. in the attic. And then everyone just starts to kind of remember. It still gives me goosebumps every time I talk about it. And it's such wonderful connections and stories of the multi-generations that visit the museum. It's a very special place for that, where both children, adults, and then multiple generations come. You just find joy. Everyone's excited, and everyone can relate, because we all had these toys. Yeah. And we all played, and, and we all can relate in some way. So it's, it's really great that you can see that, too, here in the Toy Miniature Museum. And also the miniatures downstairs, when you see them, it's just pure craft of People just wonder, how is that possible? Yeah. How is that made? <laughs> and so studying the both the miniatures and the toys is really incredible. And so two floors of, of just pure pleasure. We just say, it's just almost like you flew to vacation, you know, and you come out all renewed. Or flew back mm -hmm. to your childhood. You do? Is flew back where to your you fly, fly back to. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting because I saw downstairs the magnifying glasses oh, hanging yeah. that probably go around everybody's, yeah, everybody's yeah, neck. neck. And they just, they and, just study and it. And you need those because the miniatures, <laughs> like you said, how and how did they do that? Yeah. How, they, how they put those together? So And, you know, the artists study it for the sake of understanding every gear because those are fun functional typically they don't they don't just mimic the objects they mimic the function too so we have um we have pianos that work we have tuning keys for them and you know we have little guns and we have, we have just all of those things uh, instruments that you could use and that if you take them apart the dovetails are there for right. furniture and so you know you could perfectly open drawers and so that's what makes it Super interesting that the miniature artists take it to that level. And really, it is, it is an, I always say for folks that might not know how to envision it, it's like, and I'll give a pitch to the Nelson, it's like Nelson and miniature. It's that, the jewel of, of art. In yeah, miniature, right, so. right. And you've come a long way from the Terman mm -hmm. Mansion, that, yes. that's for sure. And that's where I originally saw oh, everything. That's wonderful. how long ago it was. Yeah. That's how. That's how old I am, and that's how old my children are, okay? But that was the last place. Mm -hmm. And to go from there to here has been just unbelievable to have your yes. own building. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you went from, well, you went from about 7,500 square feet to 33,000 yep. square feet. Yeah, and we did. it is just 
He did. It is just incredible what, so what has been, been done. Several renovations uh, going forward, and then the Turman Mansion um, had the original museum where Mary Harris Francis and Barbara Marshall envisioned that they would they would um, have their own museum. And you know, there the story goes that that they were collecting and collecting, and they just couldn't house it anymore and so no 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 point, no wait a minute they couldn't stop collecting <laughs> they, okay is what was the problem collecting. i think they both had a little bit of an obsession here, they okay? did. and so but their joy was to really wanting to share it with yeah. everybody else and so it was like you ought to get a museum and you know they did to their credit they created we're on university umkc campus right and so um, they've created an amazing museum, and it grew from that. Yeah, and it grew from their own collections, too, which is amazing. It did. So we have Mary Harris Francis. And if, if, I've got, if I've got this right, she was born in 1927. Mm -hmm. She didn't get her first dollhouse until That's 1974. Right. That's true. A poor, neglected child. She didn't have a dollhouse <laughs> until she was almost 50 years mm -hmm. old, and she told her husband, quote, I'll yep. never need and another. another one. Right? It was just the start of it. Right, it? <laughs> exactly. And you can see the dollhouse in back right now. This isn't it. This isn't it. It's no. actually across from us. And yeah, if you right. visit, it will be it will be next to the optical toys. But it is a beautiful dollhouse. And you know, there's something about childhood and how you play with dollhouses. It's it's almost you control that world. Mm -hmm. And it really allows us to express ourselves. And so it's important for us to have, we all had some kind of a, whether it was a figure that we positioned in a certain way or flick them or put them, you know, put the animals together. And that is something that Mary Harris Francis loved. She loved the toys. She loved the kind of history behind how we play right. with the toys. And so we really continue collecting in, in the venue of our founders that to kind of continued their legacy as Mayor Harris Francis just really wanted to show the history of play, the stories behind right. it. And so the more story in them, the more used and played with, the, that's what she just loved. Yeah. Now this is the Coleman this dollhouse the behind Coleman us. Dollhouse. That's from Lebanon, Pennsylvania, yes. correct? And uh, that's a dollhouse. That okay. Now that is a dollhouse. It is. <laughs> we open it for Christmas. So right. it opens up. And then it's got two wings. And if you imagine it has electricity, it has a little gas stove, which wouldn't probably be, wow. a, wouldn't be a part of our toys anymore. But you could go into one of the levels and just play there. Gosh, that is yeah. absolutely amazing. I saw some other dollhouses there from Asbury Park, from an old uh, yeah. mansion that was torn down somewhere else. How do you, how do you go about collecting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how you um, determine what is good enough for good enough. the museum sure. and what just doesn't quite make yeah, it. Yeah, well, I said earlier, you know, we try to kind of go in the venue of our founders and, and kind of express what they wanted to collect. But we collect some 30 years back, especially for the, for the toys. And we look at what we have, what mm -hmm. we're missing, what are some important toys. And we have a collecting period. And so if our collecting period is when uh, folks offer us something for donation, and then we also travel. Uh, our curators travel pretty extensively and then look for items that we can bid in in the auction right. and just try to collect historically important toys and also look at the miniatures to engage with artists. Right. And so many a times... Um, um, Barbara Marshall, she, on the other hand, commissioned artists. And so she gave them, and I call it now the, the uh, Museum of Dreams, because she commissioned artists to make whatever you've always wanted to make. You're right. Uh, what regardless. toy did you want that you didn't get? <laughs> you make it. <laughs> That's right. So that goes for the miniatures, actually. So right. that they would be doing miniatures gotcha. in terms of their skill and their level of what they've always wanted to make or might have not had a time. Because these artists for the miniatures, they they study entire rooms and then they recreate them. Right. And so these we call these room boxes. Yeah, right. Because I've seen some of the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you see some, they have rugs. Yes. They have oh wallpaper. The weavings. They, yes. have, uh, they have the miniature pianos yes. that are in there. Oh. And, you know, it's a, it's like, 
you, a, a little girl's playing in her dollhouse, and <laughs> mom will come in and say, the piano does not belong in the bathroom. And they'll go, my piano belongs in the bathroom, mom. So, and yeah. you can just use your own imagination, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what makes it really beautiful. The collection is of two very distinct uh, collecting objects, where one is made for miniatures by artists, and one is made for for children to play with. Yeah. And so it's really kind of distinct in that way. There's some blurred boundaries that folks uh, come like, what's a toy and what's a miniature? So I think the last renovation was great that allowed us separate mm -hmm. the toys and the miniatures where we, we, we put them in each own floor to kind of give it its distinction. Yeah, right. And so that was important for us. Yeah, really. And let's talk a little bit about how Mary, Mary Harris Francis and Barbara Marshall got together on yeah. this. I know, uh, 1982, she, uh, Mary Harris Francis co-founded the museum. Was that with Barbara Marshall yes. at that time? Yes. So the two of them somehow mm -hmm. either knew each other yeah, or had were, gotten together or maybe friends. they crossed paths yeah. somewhere. Someone was collecting miniatures, mm -hmm. the other one was collecting dollhouses. Yeah. So, so they were friends and, you know, they both um, had a shared vision of collecting small things, if you will, or things that uh, would bring you to this imaginary world. And so... Um, Barbara Marshall actually uh, received, always loved receiving from her father from right. his trips uh, when he would go to the smallest thing. And he'd he get her and he the smallest, her the smallest thing smallest to bring thing. back. Yeah. So he cultivated this, uh, this kind of love for small things. And um, one time he went to um, Eric Pearson's uh, gallery in New York and he got her this little peg doll on a on a uh, rocker, and that was one of the first miniatures that she got, like actual fine scale miniatures. And then all of a sudden he keeps bringing them back, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden she's finding she's them in finding other places, well. right? Yeah. And same thing with yeah. the dollhouses. Mm -hmm. with, uh, and you that know. was in the 1950s, and by 1970 she was a full blown collector of yeah. miniatures. Yeah. And, and, where, and where'd she keep those at that time? Was just in her home? I think she did, yeah. Okay. I think she did. And she. She traveled a lot. She traveled a lot alone, but she also traveled with Bill Robertson. He's a um, fine-scale fine miniature artist who is local uh, Kansas Cityan, another wonderful, wonderful person in Kansas City. Yeah. And so they traveled together too to visit artists and and collect the finest, finest of the finest of the miniatures. And so they specifically concentrated on what's called one to twelve scale fine-scale miniatures. And so every inch it's to a foot, if you will. Um, we have now have a new gallery or a couple of galleries downstairs that we can experiment a little bit more. We opened uh, a couple of uh, years ago East uh, Gallery where we experiment with um, how miniatures really influence the world mm -hmm. and influence the art world. And so that's allowing us to go outside of the one to twelve scale. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. And she uh, also she was at the art in the art department she at uh, Hallmark, right? She was. Correct. She was. And what was she doing? Was she drawing the car, like the fronts of the cards, and the? She she was. I mean, she was uh, part of Hallmark, but she was also an avid um, docent at uh, the Nelson Atkins, and so she would give tours there. Um, so both of the ladies were just prolific, not just from their collecting, but learning about how how to share it with others. Right. And so that's what that's what's become their lifelong passion, really, yeah. at the end. And, of the and you've years. carried that on. And, and for her, <laughs> too, I guess she encouraged, as, as we talked, sure. artists to create their own miniatures mm -hmm. and that yeah. she may or may not use them here, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it was uh, for them as well. And, you know, it's just uh, the depart. she's the... Uh, for her, for it to work, she was the uh, she had fine arts by the Kansas City, Art, the Kansas Institute, City Art Institute. Correct? Yeah. That's right. Sorry, That's I didn't right. get that out there <laughs> that, that, right that away. Yeah. Yes, um, but you know, I just feel like I've never met neither Mary Harris Francis or Barbara Marshall, and they have since passed. But um, really, carrying on their legacy, um, their families have been on the museum board, and right. really allowed us to kind of learn from that and so this museum has been here for some 40 years now and it has really bring joy to so many people mm -hmm. um, and, and I and I feel like it's so special in a way that we are engaging now artists so through new exhibitions 
We have a um, local artist go miniatures right. is a new exhibition coming up. And that one would have engaged local artists because we have this new gallery in a way that we, we couldn't before, but it's going to bring them into the space and it's going to allow them study the miniatures and then exhibit. We had some 140 artists apply for this mm -hmm. exhibition and we'll have some, I think, 30, 35 artists showing. Uh, and so it's bringing the ability to kind of speak of the fine scale miniatures as right. art. Right. And that is very important for the museum to really be seen as an art and history museum. Right. And in both of them, and, that, and part of that is philanthropy, because yes, they're reaching is. out to mm -hmm. have people help create things. And of course, the uh, Francis Foundation, Fra Francis Family Foundation, they fund Child Development yeah. Institute over at Penn Valley Community College here in Kansas City. Yeah. And they train children, uh, they train child care providers, which you know is one of the things mm -hmm. of giving back to giving Kansas back. City. Which, they have and, and they continue to give back yes. because of... Yes. So um, they have been really, the family has been an amazing supporter of the museum. Yeah. Um, and so uh, though they have now stepped back, uh, they still continue to serve on some of the committees and they are on collecting committees. Right. And so they allow us to kind of continue looking at the objects that are offered to us uh, during the collecting period that we can uh, look at. And you know, a lot of new generation is not interested of what's in your attic or what's in my right. attic anymore. Uh, a lot of younger generation looks for they don't want our experiences. Stuff. <laughs> they don't want our stuff anymore. And so oftentimes um, folks look for these dear objects to be to be loved. Yeah. Uh, and we get offered a lot of collections, not just from individuals, but sometimes some of these small house museums close up. Mm -hmm. And I say, would you like all of our collection? But we cannot become a top spin top collection. We cannot become uh, one type of collection. So we typically ask them, can we, you ask how we collect, we ask them, can we select uh, a nice uh, feature or selection of those, of the best of the best. And, and will some let you and others mm -hmm. not? Yeah. Some want to sell it yeah. in total. If they don't right? want to break up the collection <clears throat> right. in that way, but typically they want to be part of it because it is such an important museum. Right. And, and it does justice to the toys in a way we interpret it. And so as a national museum, it's a really yeah. great place to be. And it'll carry on their family tradition family too because they had collected it, yes. you know what I mean? And I think the older than the kids get, oh, I know. you know, then they become adults, they have children, <laughs> and all of a sudden they come in here and go, oh my yeah. gosh, I remember that from it's when I was true. a little kid or whatever. And so you have sort of two, I'm gonna say two parts, there's more than two mm -hmm. parts to the, to the museum, but you have, you have a permanent galleries, right. okay, right. which are here, and then you have, what I will call not, not traveling, but not, not permanent Temporary galleries. Temporary or rotating. Just, yeah. just rotating galleries, yep. that's perfect, yep. yeah. So right now you have the Black Doll Black Dolls exhibit, exhibition, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So talk about that a little bit. So the Portraits of Childhood Black Dolls exhibit um, has come about for many years. I actually traveled, um, I think when I was just starting here seven years ago to San Diego and I saw the exhibit there. And I thought, well, this exhibit would be amazing to have at the museum. And we've collect, connected with them, and they're like, well, the, the collector doesn't really want to travel it anymore. But our, our um, um, staff, uh, our curators, have continued to engage with them. Mm -hmm. And seven years later, you know, um, we have Deborah Neff, who is the, who is the collector, have allowed it to travel yet again mm -hmm. to our museum. Uh, I think because we showed that we're gonna exhibit it in a unique way, we've engaged the community, we've interpreted it with the community. Right. Uh, we've also had an advisory committee to kind of help us uh, talk about the museum. We have a symposium coming up uh, where we're gonna learn a little bit more about the exhibit and why uh, black dolls um, have been, um, there's not much known about right, black dolls. Exactly. And so really create that research and to help us understand how they, how they belong in the, in the world. And so we'll have the symposium, a couple of national speakers are coming up, but it's really been an amazing, um, kind of round to kind of see the, the, 
the exhibit come to life at the museum after seven years. Yeah, you know? really. I and just if, loved it. Right. And if you bang on the door <laughs> enough, you know, they're okay. It's These true. people are pestering it, me. Can we, let's really just send it out and no, to Kansas and it's City. Fit. And right now is the right time to do it. And so we are really trying. So we have a couple of temporary exhibit spaces in the toy um, uh, floor, which we have currently um, new collections, new acquisitions. And then the um, and then the black dolls exhibit, and then we have couple uh, downstairs. So it's constantly rotating. We are rotating. Yeah. So in a way, for you to see something new. Yeah, right. And for other people to come back. Okay, come we've back. been there, yeah. but now there's but now there's new things. Different. So we want to re-engage yeah. the public. And we a also bit. have other ways to rotate the collection. We rotate the cases. Uh, we have a, a collection um, hall of collection where we invite local local collectors who mm -hmm. might have a smaller collection to showcase their collection in the case. Yeah. So that one's, that one's pretty uh, popular as well. And it brings people like you who might have airplanes or, or cars to right. the museum and be able to just be proud of your collection. Yeah, it, it's fun to see toys from the mm -hmm. attic instead of toys in the attic, uh, yeah. okay, which, which was a movie which we don't want to get oh. into, but toys from the attic is a good thing. Sounds like a Toys nightmare. in the attic is uh, <laughs> it's a little bit different, but yeah, yeah it's uh, and that. And then talk about some of the stuff that may be mm -hmm. coming up in the future and things sure. that you are, are dreaming about trying to get you as know, well. You know, a couple of things that I will say about one or the other is so most immediately is the local artist go miniatures, which will be featuring some 35 local artists making 12 by 12. We did not justify that it has to be fine scale uh, miniatures. And then we are looking to have Native American miniatures. Mm -hmm. So we're now traveling to Native American shows to purchase some of them. So that would be an amazing kind of addition to our Native uh, American collection that right. we already have. To speak about the to speak about um, kind of a new um, way of where of where collecting and making miniature can take us. And then in the toys, uh, we're looking at Star Wars. So bringing in oh, Star gosh. Wars, which That'll be big. again, uh, that will be big. Uh, again, an enthusiastic collector, uh, a local, not local, I'm sorry, uh, but an art uh, collector who, who just loved collecting all those toys. Wow. Yeah, That's so amazing. that one yeah. should be fun. That one yeah. should be uh, fun Yeah, I was all. talking to Ben. <laughs> he, has a, he has a friend of his family, Ben Nestor, who's our great podcast guy. Uh, at Marquee Creative, but uh, he has a guy who collects Pez. Yes, he's collected Pez dispensers oh, I forever. Pez I mean, dispensers. my God, they are, yes, right. they're amazing. I used to actually have quite a few. I tried to get my son collect Pez yeah. dispensers. And, and I've known people <laughs> that collected lunch boxes. Yes, I mean, there's all of kinds of it's just important. things that are out yeah. there. It's, they're, they're and just it is incredible. kind of what, what we get offered oftentimes. And so when you ask, how do we collect? We have to kind of justify uh, what we collect. And so we, we would not collect lunch boxes, even though that has a toy uh, yes, section. Right. And so um, it's really interesting of, of what people kind of hold on to, to, to learn from them yeah. uh, what their loves were. Um, but we all have collected something. Yeah, some right, things. right. I wish I would have saved it all because mm -hmm. I, I had, I think when I got my toss, I got a slinky. Slinky. Or the old slinky toy, oh, okay, you know, down, right. the stairs, down the stairs, the whole thing, just yeah. mesmerize you for yeah. hours. And that and the toy soldiers, mm -hmm. the little oh, plastic yeah. toy soldiers that you see in Toy Story, the movie, Story. right? And uh, it, it's it's just, boy, if I'd only, <laughs> instead I was taking them outside and I was putting them in these models I made and I was sticking firecrackers in there and oh, blowing them well, all Well, see, up, this is so. the kind of stories that then happen around the museum. And you walk around and that's what you remember. Yeah, it's exactly. I actually, it made me think, because growing up in Czechoslovakia, a former Czechoslovakia, um, you know, I had these toys that I was just through this museum remembering of, I had this Monchichi, and it's a little monkey with a face and it sucks its thumb. And it was just the most amazing. I had a couple of them and they had little tails, so I yeah. think they were monkeys. Um, but I just, you know, it makes you remember what you had and, and the dolls that I have played with. Um, and I didn't have that many of them, but you know, I did pierce their ears and mm -hmm. cut their hair, made them, made them red. So it was just makes you remember these memories. And through these memories, we have programs like the story connection mm -hmm. for folks with dementia and, um, and it allows them to kind of 
bring back. Boy, that's a great idea. Bring back Gosh. kind of the back memory. So they walk around the museum mm -hmm. for a tour and then hands-on activities. Right. You it, see the you can just you see them see light up, start, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh my in a gosh. safe place, in a place of items that they uh, relate to for them and their caregivers. And it really is a program that has started to be super popular uh, with nursing homes that come and bring uh, sure. bring their clients. And you can just see folks light up through through Gosh. the through the stories of their childhood. Now that's amazing. Then maybe that you know the caregiver stuff can go back and then try to yes. find items like mm -hmm. at garage sales or whatever, mm -hmm. not here, but and then yeah. take them to engage realize them to to reengage yeah. them and yeah. try to keep no, it. That it's, is it's really powerful. Right, it's right. Really that, powerful. Yeah, that's phenomenal. So when I always try to make my wife feel bad, I always tell her that when I was <laughs> a little kid, I, I never had a teddy bear. Oh. So I said, that, "See, that's part of my problem." I, I've never had a teddy bear. So for my last birthday, she bought me <laughs> she a, teddy a teddy bear. bear. Okay, that's for last birthday. Oh, so I, I finally got my teddy bear. And I can't use that argument anymore, okay? No, no, you but can't. she had a teddy bear for when she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And she called it Waldo. And it was, you know, its <laughs> eyes are falling out, its nose is coming off. Yep. and they're all. So I went and I got it re-stuffed and re-stitched. Oh. Not back to pristine, but there's still the yeah. stitching in it yeah. or whatever you can see where they had to operate on the bear. But, mm -hmm. and I gave it to her and she just broke down. Yeah. I mean, it was, she had remembered that, yeah. but they are, they are the powerful stories that can they be are, we've, related we've here. Left a part of your childhood with, yes. with that toy. And we have, we have stories here in um, the toy section where we have the picture of the girl that was playing with the, with a teddy yes, bear. Uh -huh. And then we have a picture of them as an, as an, older woman still hugging the same bear. Yes, I, mean, I saw her back there. She yeah. has the bear and she has a little she dog. Has a little, yeah. She has her dog and she has the bear she in her lap. She remembers punching the bear in the nose when she was angry. <laughs> and, and it's just, it it's really stays with us, these stories. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's better than kicking the family dog. Okay, so <laughs> punching the that. teddy bear is just fine. You well, know? we all do something. Yeah, I, hey, you have to get rid of those frustrations you, somehow, you, right? You can find secrets in those stories. You do. Toys, you talk to them. Yeah, yep. you talk to them. They help you grow up and sometimes toys were made to kind of help us to be adults as yeah. well and so that's a lot of those little kitchens and how to be you know learning how to be parents yes those are some of the oh toys really do a lot more than just just play yeah that, yeah. that is absolutely true let's talk about your background yeah, for a little absolutely. bit and how you got here yeah. back in 2017 yeah. you have a very I think you have a very fascinating background <laughs> you're, you're born in the in, in Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic or Chesnia now. And so it, it has all changed for you. Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up back in mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia? So I grew up in communism. Right. My parents. You had a pretty tough childhood, I my think. My parents were in communism for 40 years. For me, it was only 15. But what I always say, like, when it changed, you didn't know any better. I mean, we played. Um, but I knew you couldn't say some things in the house. You know, my 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 parents never joined the party, if you will. So there was always a at the kitchen table. There was always discussions, and my grandpa was always uh, very adamant, and and he was an orator who would go to the local pub and just sit at the head of the table and just and just speak his mind. Yeah. And as little kids, um, you know, we were we were able to go in a little jar to go get beer for so we would go I would I would go and walk with a with a ceramic jug to go get beer for my dad. And you didn't sneak any sips. I, of course not. <laughs> and so you get to the pub, you know, you, you just about clear the smoke. So you're just mm -hmm. about under that. And I just remember placing the jug above and then just there's grandpa's voice. And I just kind of like, oh, gosh, there's grandpa preaching to the preaching to the pub. And so that was my way of kind of learning. There's something just not to be said. There's some things that for us to be safe, right. you had to. You have to kind of be watch what mindful you say. and watchful. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, um, communism fell. And I remember one night there were there were tanks rolling through my village. And, oh you know, you, you hear this rolling coming in and you just peer out the window. And so you're wondering what's happening. And they just were exiting. They were going through all the small villages to kind of right, go back to, to, exit, to Russia. To yeah. Back to Russia. Yeah. And so we knew something new was coming and happened through our what's called Velvet Revolution that was a peaceful, peaceful transition of power. And since then, it was a 
democratic country. And so right. at 15, you know, I, I saw it through smell and through sight and everything suddenly became colorful right. and music came in from America and, you know, the, all the things that were snuck in before poured in the food and the color and the music and, and everything that was forbidden um, just came through with, with the good and the, the, good and, and, the and the bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so at 15, and that had to be transformative for you because really was, was that the time you started to think, Mm -hmm. I can now go to America? It was. Well, you know, I, we always... It didn't happen right away, of course. It didn't happen right mm -hmm. away, but fairly run away, right away because we learned these uh, nursery rhymes and different languages. So I, I, I had to learn Russian, and then I always knew Slovakian. So, and then right after we learned German. So very quickly, by 15, I had three languages, which is pretty... That's phenomenal. Which is pretty common. Amer um, Americans rarely have common. two. Okay, I so know, yeah. But I remember this nursery rhyme in English for some reason in elementary school that spoke about um, going and traveling to America, and it was something that stuck with me. And so I completed high school, and then um, I came and um, started studying in America in Ohio University. And yeah. I started studying art. Right. You had Ohio University, your art studio assistant at the Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the Museum, of, Kennedy art. Museum yeah. of Art there, too. So you jumped right. right into, but that had always been, were you always sort of an artist when you were you young? Know, I was trying to do a lot of drawing, but, it, you know, we were in communism. Yeah. So it was kind of like, well, get a get It a was suppressed. It was yeah. suppressed. Mm -hmm. Get a secretarial degree, and then you will, because I went to a um, high school that had kind of a typing, you know, to do a typewriter, a shorthand, and economics. So it was an economics-slated uh, uh, high school. And so I, I was, I was to be a secretary because that right. was a, it was a good job to have. But I drew on a side, and I, I I went to galleries. So when I came to America, I really wanted to study something that that I wanted to explore, and it was yeah. in me, even though it wasn't cultivated as much. But it was in me, so I studied art. I got both BFA and an MFA. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And so you took advantage of the American I system did. as well I from did. that standpoint. I did. Which you know, mm -hmm. a lot of us here, we it's almost <laughs> like the Toys and Miniatures Museum. Yeah. You drive by it all the time, but they never yeah. stop. Yeah, you see what true. I mean? It, it's there. Mm -hmm. It's available for you, but you've got to stop well, in and take advantage of it. Yeah, coming. now they all do. Yeah. But it was it was a very special time for me to be able to come to America. Now I friended an American who uh, many Americans came flooding in after the revolution ended teaching. Uh, yes. And so I friended an American and then we came back together to to study. Um, both of us studied at Ohio University. And so, and then I went on to study in um, University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. Yeah, so at, at Dartmouth, that right. That was where I did more of the MFA and, you know, you have your own studio. And I started right. as a ceramicist, then I did sculpture, and then I kind of ended up doing installation. Yeah, it's also visual and performing arts. Did you perform? No, it was more installation. Okay, it was more, so okay. I did more installation. So, so you're on a stage crew, as you used to call it. Right? You used to draw all the backdrops right, for, the, for all the plays, et cetera, well, et cetera, I right? I traveled actually uh, installing. So I did not keep a ceramic studio, but I, I started sewing different forms. There were mm -hmm. a lot of related with the body. And so I would then create large installations uh, that, that reminded you, like, as if you were entering inside the body or inside the mind. That was kind of my visceral way of, and a lot of it, I think my, my teacher, then teachers were trying to lure out of me that, you know, my childhood kind of suppression from the communist sure, era. Sure. And they were trying to have me kind of create artwork. And my artwork was somewhat dark, if you will. Yeah, sure, <laughs> absolutely, it would be, yeah. Um, and so I traveled a lot and I started showing um, artwork and, you know, it was, it was amazing to have your own studio and then be a, be a director of exhibitions and kind of, on yeah. the, I felt on the side, you, you were admi administering the arts and um, I got married and I think I was installing and I was so pregnant then that every time I was climbing ladders, every time I bend over, I had to go pee. And so it was like, that's it. I, I think that might be my last, last exhibition for, for, for that time. And so you know, I, had, I had my son, Max. And then I kind of was easier to then 
become an administrator, if you want, mm -hmm. became a curator also at, at Canadian Museum of Art, where I first um, was a student. Yes. Uh, and then I left for MFA, and then I came back and became um, a curator and a director of right. exhibitions. And then, and then you go, and you, 2015, I think it was, you go become director of the National Czech and Slovak oh. Museum and Library back. in... Hold it, I Cedar know, Rapids, I Iowa. <laughs> I mean, I'm Cedar going, Rapids. what? <laughs> well, so in the 1800s, um, Iowa was um, really bringing a lot of a lot of immigrants mm -hmm. in, and they had a meatpacking factory, and so a lot of Czechs were coming in, and they created an entire village. So all the street signs, they had Czech pubs, and it was it was it was very much of a Czech community then. So they needed to create kind of wow. a historical museum, yes. and it was beautiful. And became a tour, it became a tourist, tourist destination, destination, right? Destination, yeah. yeah. And so it really that museum. I was trying to go from being a curator to a, to be a director, and yeah. so really um, the world usually tells you what you're missing, and the world told me I needed to do fundraising, uh -huh. and so becoming a fundraiser, a director of national. Um, uh, development at the, the National Czech and Slovak Museum was, I was the most authentic person that one could find because I look Czech, I speak Czech, right. my name is Czech. <laughs> and so visiting with these um, immigrants, the Czech immigrants across the country was an amazing couple of years yes. to, to, to ask of their stories and why they were in America right. and, and fundraise for that museum. And you got re in touch with your own. I did. Life I and actually, childhood. I did, and I think it was. I didn't realize how emotional and kind of it took a toll on me because I had to, I had to speak about my history as mm -hmm. well and all the smells again and all the sounds. Every time I would hear then some type of a polka or Czech music, I would just start crying. crying. Yeah. I was so <laughs> raw because it was just cons, you know, I traveled, uh, I think, 35% of the time. And so it was constant the reminder of, I was became so homesick after right. like 20 years of being in America. I right. was so homesick um, that I thought I had to kind of, I had, I had to look for another thing. Uh, it was just, it was beautiful, but it was just too close yeah. to, to the heart. Do you travel back? I do. Very often. Yeah, do you still have uh, mm -hmm. relatives there? So my parents were still there. My oh, they're still there. there. Wonderful. Yeah, everybody yeah. stayed. Uh, I came alone, um, I think in my 20s. And so, um, you know, I visit my parents every year. That's um, wonderful. And so yeah. they still live in the same village, yeah. the same um, the same house. And so it's wow. it's coming home. It's, it's not much has changed in those yeah, villages. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So when you were up there and then all of a sudden, how, how did this happen to become director mm -hmm. here at the National yeah. Museum of Toys and Miniatures so for you? The museum was looking for the next director. Um, Jamie Berry, my predecessor, was here 10 years and was looking to retire. And so they had a national search. And at that time, I started to look. And so with my background of being in museums, also uh, understanding uh, the arts and crafts mm -hmm. because I was working in ceramics. So, um, and then knowing how to fundraise, uh, they were interested in, in bringing me in and I thought, oh, toys and miniatures, you know, the, how am I gonna translate this, this art and gallery because I was a curator. And I just fell in love with the museum. They, they brought me up for a visit and... Had you ever been to Kansas City before? I have not, I have okay. not. So I traveled a couple times here and um, the board took me around the museum and around the city and I just fell in love with the collection. They just came in through a renovation of the museum. They opened a brand new museum in 2015. And so it was stunning. And then Kansas City, uh, Vincent Gautier, the the then board chair has took me on a uh, took me on a night oh yeah the little tour yeah <laughs> and I drove down Ward Parkway I'm Ward sure Parkway, you know and all and those we, places we yeah. did a little bar hopping <laughs> and it was wonderful um it just it was just the it just had the right feel for me yeah. and so I've I've been in the midwestern towns and so it felt right and you know they say the rest is history yeah well, what did the years. family think well I mean my family you know they. They just kind of hear what I do. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea what you they, do, right? <laughs> they, they they enjoy it, but they're they have traveled here a couple times. I mm -hmm. think in the seven years they might have come 
they've come for my wedding, they came for one of my graduation, and I'm gonna say they came one more time, um, maybe when Max was born. Uh -huh. That was it, uh -huh. yeah. And then they kind of was like, you have to come to us. <laughs> yeah, right, we're, we're not, we're not we're climbing not on that airplane anymore. anymore. Yeah, we're yeah. not traveling. And how old's Max now? Max is 14. Oh gosh, yeah, I know, okay. he volunteers at the museum, oh, so we good. have a junior membership. Training him right, Training yeah. Training him right. And Absolutely. So we have junior membership at the museum that, that brings really the young folks to the museum and uh, and then the you as a young person can bring the adults with you. Yes. So it's kind of your ownership of the museum and really to try to have them bring them up with the museum so then they can, as they grow up, as we all do, right. then they can share it with their children. Right. And I think that's part of your job here mm -hmm. is the branding and getting it out there yeah. to the public again. So I'm sure they have field trips to reach out mm -hmm. to all the school districts, right? Yeah, we right? have K through 12 folks come in and we have homeschoolers who come in too. Um, and then, you know, we are trying to bring both adults and children uh, workshops and activities um, at the museum. Right. So we had sketching workshops, uh, KCAI and uh, UMKC. We have partnership that their students can come and sketch right. and draw at the museum. And so it really, we're trying to bring folks from different directions. We have make and make and uh, uh, paint and sip and make and sip, which is for adults that mm -hmm. you can make a little miniature painting and then you sip wine. Like oh, said. perfect. Gosh, <laughs> we get, tried that's I think, for the first time to, to, to serve a miniature wine, but the, the, they're like, no, you we mean, want the big one. Right, yeah. I'll, I'll take the 10 <laughs> ounce glass. To, you can leave the one ounce one. glass with somebody else, okay? I don't but, need you know, that one. For yeah. all, and then for, for families, we've tried, we've had it for the first time a couple of years now. A camp, a drop-off camp. Mm -hmm. So summers are busy here at the museum as well, where we have uh, kids dropped off and we have activities for them. So yeah. it's really kind of trying to find the um, uh, activities for both adults, children, and now we're really trying to uh, have have elderly folks who come with, yeah. with who have uh, memory um, loss. Which I think is wonderful. We're that's really incredible. trying to kind of engage all of them either separately or at once, because that generational connection here is so deep. It is. That, yeah, it really is. Yeah. I told you about the slinkies and toy soldiers. I know, and whether um, it's adults that bring, <laughs> bring the children or the children then bring the adults, there's something that usually happens and you're like, oh my God, I bring, I got to bring auntie here. Or I got to sure. bring grandma. And then it's such a mix of folks in the museum that that's what, that's what we're trying to really do. What are the biggest challenges mm -hmm. for you? Well, you know, the biggest challenge was uh, starting as a, as a director and then a couple of years there was COVID. Oh, so yeah. closing up was tough and uh, kind of being the, the freshly minted director was, it was a challenge. Uh, I think it kind of took the, the wind out of my sails, but I remember Bob Simmons, who is, is, was our uh, board member, he said, Petra, it's how you get through it. And then what's on the other side? And I just had another, another way of mm -hmm. understanding, well, that is my that is my focus now right. and so really the challenges are kind of day to day of what's happening in the world these days how to how to bring people once they're in the in the, the indoor they love it you know how do you bring people? gotta get them in so the right sort of advertising the right sort of outreach the right sort of fundraising that we do and then programs also which exhibits do we bring in and which programs do we bring in so a lot of the learning and engagement um, staff and the curatorial staff work really closely together. So what I have kind of passionately worked towards is that we have a really great team that mm -hmm. works together, that reaches out to the community and that we can bring things, not only that we have the collection, but how does it impact right. um, the, the community? And so bringing the community in, in kind of new ways is whether it's a concert, or a theater production, or or somebody just wants to use our spaces for uh, a book club or right. something like that. So it's important to really bring people in, lure them in in some way, because once once they're in, they just cannot stop exploring. Yeah. Did you loan some of your stuff out to we other do, museums do, as well? We do sometimes. We don't. We have a pretty small staff. Mm -hmm. um, when I started, we had um, ten staff. Now we have fourteen. So we've we've upped a little bit because we're expanding the programs as much. But yeah, we do. When we had um, 
when we get um, when we get inquiries, we, mm -hmm. we lend our our works. They're a little harder to travel. The miniatures, are, even though they're small, you'd think like that would be easy to just put in a box. But they're no, they're going to break easy. They well, break yeah. easy, so we really have to be careful there. Um, we've done some traveling uh, exhibitions here, mm -hmm. uh, but we do travel the uh, the toys and locally as well. So we've lent uh, our toys both at the Union Station and the Nelson Atkins and World War One Museum. Yeah, right. Uh, and so we partner with other museums right. all the time. You know, it's a big uh, collaborative mm -hmm. effort here in Kansas really City. Is. And it's I think been, you find that's part of the reason why been, Kansas City is why, why it is. It's been you know? the most amazing thing. I think I was here a week and um, the board organized for me at the Nelson Atkins. Julian organized kind of meet and greet with all the museum and cultural organization leaders. And it was the most important thing for me where within a week I knew everyone. And then yeah. I spent the next couple of months visiting with everybody else. And it's, it's a very interesting culture here in Kansas City where we as cultural organizations um, work together so well to kind of bring everything what we have together. And so I, I just I just really love that. How are you going to engage with AI, artificial intelligence, and all the new technologies that are rolling through to try to well, as help as, enhance the visitor yes. as experience? As museums, you know, we try not to hop on trends, even though this is not a trend. <laughs> I know it's here to stay, but it gets very expensive to hop on trends because you have to yeah. upgrade all the trends that you You just wait till it all settles down and... The price comes it down. Is. Yes, absolutely. Well, but also, you know, when we want people to, at the museum, we don't want them looking at, at this darn thing. Because right. Because we want them to looking at the collection. And so, though we have interpretation through uh, the media, you know, I, Chad GPT, AI, you know, we, we work for more marketing and writing. Um, I am trying to push kind of the staff to use a little bit more of that generated mm -hmm. generative language. Um, but we still use a lot of research, so there's a lot of you know hallucination with, mm -hmm. with some of those uh, artificial intelligence, um, chat GPT, and so you have to still check, fact check it, and you have to be correct. So we still use books. No, you know, <laughs> we have a library. Geez, people read? We still I didn't read know that. at the museum, <laughs> and we really need to check it, but it's coming. I mean, folks are exploring it, but, you know, kind of, I think we need to stay true to the museum. We want people to see the objects. Yeah. And that is why we're here. We have the objects and the collection, and it needs to be studied in that way. Now, how we kind of project it out in the world, how we, uh, whether we make reels or films for it, that's important for the social media and everything. Right. But it really is important to kind of have that physicality. And I think... If we if we parse too much away from it, you know, folks don't need to come. They right. don't need to come to the museum anywhere. They can just look at it on the phone. That's right. So it's important still to to have that physicality. Yeah, I, I think it is too. Because yeah. when I came in here, I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen it on. But yeah, museums yeah. cannot avoid it. Yeah. I mean, it's coming. Yeah. Um, it makes our life easier uh, if and if you know how to use some of the generative language, it makes it faster. Yes. Um, and so it sparks, sparks ideas. It sparks ideas. Um, I'm sure that we will maybe at some point have you know workshops, AI and toys, and sure. create your own superhero or whatnot sure. in AI. But then they end up on Marvel Comics yeah, and make a billion go. dollars in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. And so I think I think it has its place. Uh, but I think museums are kind of also. So slow in, and I think for the right reason, adapters, mm -hmm. um, because we want people to kind of see yeah. the physical object. Right. And the older, mm -hmm. the better, because it takes yeah. you back and takes it more, it gathers more generations. Mm -hmm. What know. we can do is then tell the stories that we might not have and complete a visual right. story. Right. And maybe you have seen now some historical interpretation where it's generated, sure. but it really brings the toy to life or could yeah. bring the toy to life if you have if you have it set in the right context. Right. So that, I think, has a place. Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but here's, here's the, what do you think oh, one of the most notable oh, yeah, pieces in yeah. the whole yeah. museum is? You know, I think both for the toys and miniatures are some of the older, older toys that we have from the 1800s. They are just stunning. Um, 
in in the miniatures, I know some of these artists that made it, mm -hmm. and I think the notability comes from understanding how each one of those objects was made. I don't have a favorite one, I have to say. I think I do love the um, the jewelry store in the in the miniatures. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that one is is just stunning because it tells a story of 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 it's got to be kind of probably five o'clock or after hours because the gentleman's got a little bit of five o'clock shadow on his on his uh, chin and they're shopping for they're shopping obviously for something special at the jewelry counter and you can see the car in the background it's you know it's a lit a little bit more demure and so you start it starts to tell stories right you can almost hear the conversation you can start the conversations yeah. that to be at and there's so many different ways of looking at the room boxes and the toys actually for me because I did not grow up with American toys. Right. They are special for me in a way that I was kind of a student of the toys as well because I didn't have these. Mm -hmm. you know, I did not have a Barbie, but one of my neighbors did and I always wanted to play with them. And so now having a home museum uh yeah. is like you can always go back to and say the nah, 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 nah. <laughs> the toys I've never had. <laughs> That's right. Was she allowed to play with it? Or yeah, did yeah, they sort of keep she, it well, hidden? She must from have had, you know, the authorities? an auntie, an auntie yeah. that brought it. And I mean, yeah. those kind of things were, were left left alone. Yeah, if, okay. If you weren't. But yeah, I just remember all the elbows, you know, moving. And I was just, it was fascinating. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so because you didn't have one. I didn't have yeah. one. Yeah. Here we were. We had all this stuff. You yeah. know, we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> now here it is. It's all in here. Um, and then what do you think the highest valued uh, object is in here? As far as, I'm sure you look back to see how much things are worth or whatever, sure. you know, which is important mm -hmm. to know the worth yeah. of the building and worth yeah. of the things that are inside here. I might disappoint you with my answer because I'm not going to tell. <laughs> oh, God, but I just got left out. I did. You probably don't want anyone to know exactly well, what it is, right? Well, as a right? museum, we really look for items that oftentimes were played with and really some of the most precious objects are ones that bring that story and yeah. the history. Uh, obviously, we go out and purchase both both toys and miniatures, uh, but we you know we pay a fair market value or um, something that we're we're um, uh, we can afford. We have a uh, collection um, fund, and so if if folks would like to help us uh, with, sure. with funding, uh, purchasing more objects, that's always welcome. But we have a way to really bring new items in. Uh, and so as, as disappointing as my answer may be. Uh, you know, that we, wasn't which, an answer, by the way. It was okay. not. Well, that's why I'm the director. <laughs> I'll meander as long as I change the subject. Right. You're allowed to do whatever you want. I'm just a guest here, okay? Um, <laughs> if I had yeah, you in the studio, I'd be grilling you. You would, you now, would yeah. be like, but which one yeah. is it? Yeah, um, right. But I think, you know, you would know um, the older the toy. Um, sure. Probably. But we don't market it. Um, we're not looking, uh, we're only um, new, doing new acquisitions and really just sharing it is, is what's priceless for us. Yeah, right, you right. Know? So, so I can't go around to question and say, what's your oldest yeah. toy here? Well, we have them kind of behind us in 1800s. The dollhouse, yeah. yeah. By 187, I don't know yeah. if I saw anything earlier in 18. Yeah, I, no, I think 18, I saw, yeah. yeah, around 1840, yeah. I think I and saw they one. they come with the most beautiful, those dolls come with the most beautiful um, dresses. Yes. And just they're hand sewn and they also come sometimes with accessories and just um, how the material was put together. So a lot of it is, you know, wooden and, and, and uh, then you would have a porcelain. And so it's, it's how they've made these from the materials that they had is what's, it's what's beautiful, I yeah. think. And it's, it's not machine made. If you can mm -hmm. tell it was handmade and all the elbows are perfectly crafted. And so I think that's what some of the older toys teach us of the, the care and the time sure. has passed. You know, how, how would anybody even play with it? Or even how did it even look, the, right. the, the face? It was very different than from what sure. we see now. So, um, I don't know, I just, I just feel like it becomes a very historical perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is this the only museum of its kind in the country? Yes. <laughs> That's the right answer. Yeah. Absolutely. There are many, there are many um, kind of museums that collect miniatures, that collect toys, but very separately. It's a very uniquely our own 
where um, it, those two uh, objects, if you will, or collections are together. Um, we are partners with other miniature museums and we're mm -hmm. partners with other um, toy museums, but there is no other combination. Like combination. Guess, right? And then really the way that our founders have collected, um, we are, we have the finest um, fine scale miniatures in the world uh, because the way um, Barbara Marshall collected it and commissioned mm -hmm. it. And then we have one of the largest uh, collection of toys on view in, in the Midwest. And wow. so we, we can champion that we have one of the biggest or finest. Yeah. The, in, the unique. Kansas, and unique, unique in absolutely. Kansas City. And being in Kansas City, it's just, it's just you know, amazing. It fits here really well. Yeah. And so I hope, I hope our listeners will um, take a cue and come visit us yeah. because you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Oh, I, I, just, I just loved did. it. Yeah, and <laughs> just tell me, just before we get out of here, mm -hmm. just uh, tell me your thoughts on Kansas City in general, oh. living here and, and being here and just, uh, yeah. you know, because you are a worldwide traveler and yeah, you have been a you. lot of places. Now you are here in Kansas yeah. City. I've, I've loved it. It was, I think I said it was the first month I started meeting people's cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew you had to it was a special place and you knew you have to behave <laughs> That's right. uh, but it is a very friendly place uh, I find it and maybe I'm somewhat insular in the arts and so it is it is both uh, from from knowing what to do with your family knowing how how to travel out or or how what to eat it's just been a very welcoming warm and um really gracious city for, yeah. for a newcomer uh, to come in and um, kind of start learning about a museum and, and a small child and so kind of learning our way around has mm -hmm. been has been beautiful um, hot summers and cold we, winters <laughs> yeah we have I those. came from Ohio so it was humid there too yeah. Czechoslovakia um, has their own winters we do. to deal with okay we do. Uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of cold and and, and dark but um, just just love it. I mean, I, I now live in the West Side and I walk around the Penn Valley uh, Park and the World War One Museum yes. uh, with my doggos. And it's it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's I just great. love it. Well, welcome. Thank to you. Kansas, to you oh, and your family. It. Please stay yes. for a long period of time. We'd love to have you in this place. is just Thank just incredible. For, me. for all of you who have not been here for a long period of time. And <laughs> I know you did it with your kids. Maybe now you can do it with your grandkids or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are all together. It, it is one of the most unique places in the entire country really? and it's right here in town right on oak right on the umkc campus you can't miss it everybody knows where it is just stop by and say hello to petra and her entire staff here Absolutely. it's just been incredible thank you petra, so much thank you so much it. it's been yeah, wonderful it's been yeah wonderful. and folks come on out and petra visit. and the toy and miniature museum just one of the reasons why we always say there's just something about kansas city <laughs> There's Just Something About Kansas City is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization with the mission of documenting the stories that have built our city to inspire and educate generations to come. Our work is made possible by the generous support of local partners such as the Cockrell Family Foundation and the Sherman Family Foundation. For more information about how you can help us share these stories, visit our website at somethingaboutkc.org. Thank you.